Well, it is truly amazing when we just take a step back and look at this process of hibernation, look at this process of estivation, what's happening physiologically to this creature. Basically, all their systems are shutting down, but not to the point where they die, <laughs> but just very close to death. It's, it's suspended animation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Ivana, and today I have Dr. Frank Sherwin, ICR research scientist and zoologist here joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. It is good to be here. Well, great. We're glad to have you. And today I wanted to talk about um, an ex exciting topic in my life, at least. I would say it's one of my favorite hobbies. And unfortunately, it's not really a, an ability that I possess, but there are some animals who do this quite well or something similar to this, and I'm referring to hibernation. Uh, hibernation is an amazing metabolic process. It's a state of reduced metabolic activity, so much so that the respiration of the creature uh, decreases, the heart rate decreases, and the temperature goes down significantly. And all of this is due to physiological changes within the creature, and they can maintain this ability of almost suspended animation that we call hibernation for months and months at a time, some just weeks at a time. It all depends on the species. But what we do find is that over 200 different kinds of animals can undergo this process that we call hibernation. Wow, 200 different kinds of animals. Um, I did not know that actually. Yeah. Um, so with hibernation, you've mentioned that this is lots of different changes within the animal. So is hibernation sleeping? Is that the same thing? Well, it's it's a way of sleeping. A lot of people think sleeping, and that is, that's mm -hmm. the way it is for, like, for exa example, some bears, mm -hmm. some of the brown bears and black bears. They hibernate for the winter, and that's kind of a general, uh, generic kind of way of saying it, although the mother bears can give birth to cubs and even lactate during this time of hibernation. And so what we find with that kind of hibernation is the creature is somewhat active uh, a little bit for a short period of time and then descends into something that they call in zoology torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R. -O -O and that is just a reduced metabolic activity. Mm -hmm. Then they kind of wake up again. They achieve almost consciousness uh, only to go back into a torpor-like condition, reduced metabolic condition for a period of time. And so it's basically a wave like this throughout the months. And so that's why the word hibernation is just a little bit too vague, kind of, kind of generic, but it does mean a reduced metabolic activity for the creature, whether it's a, a bear or a woodchuck or even a hummingbird. Uh, a lot of the wild birds like to un uh, are des designed to undergo this torpor. Wow, okay. So could you explain maybe some of your favorite examples of animal hibernation and how they're, they're using this feature? <laughs> I think probably one of my favorite examples that have to be three creatures. One is the bat. Bats are okay. experts in hibernation. And then there's also the, uh, the ground squirrel and the woodchuck. And so for some reason, we find bats and ground squirrels and woodchucks really excel at this ability of hibernation. For example, the respiration of the woodchuck goes right down to about maybe two breaths per minute. And, you know, in order to do that, metabolic functions really have to be decreased because breathing is very, very important, obviously, for the creature. And so those are my favorite hibernators. They sleep so deeply that you can actually handle a bat. You can handle a woodchuck and you can't even wake them up. Their sleep is so deep, and they are so deeply into this state of almost suspended animation. It's, it's really quite amazing. Wow, that is very interesting. Um, so with these animals, you've mentioned different ones that I wouldn't have even put in the hibernation category. I don't know if you can give us a broad overview of what kinds of animals experience hibernation, and do they all hibernate at the same time? No, they, they hibernate at different times. As okay. a matter of fact, there's something called estivation. Now, estivation has been called summer sleep. 
So when a creature, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a mammal, for example, but if a creature finds that the temperature gets too high or that there's not enough food or there's a danger of, of um, you dying of thirst, you know, they, they dehydrate, they go into this summer sleep, also called estivation. So that all depends on the, the creature. There's no hard line that we can say as to who undergoes uh, hibernation or estivation in the summer and who doesn't. You almost have to take it by a case-by-case -case basis. But as I mentioned, there's over 200 species of animal that actually are hibernators. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I didn't know summer could be an option because we normally think of the bears, as you mentioned, right. it's a wintertime uh -huh. activity that animals would undergo. It's only during the winter, but it could be different factors that right. cause. Exactly. And that's the thing with bears. You know, when I was growing up, I just thought bears, you know, go to sleep for the winter mm -hmm. and then they wake up all grouchy and, and hungry and all that. But that's a little bit too generic. Mm -hmm. And that, as I say, the bears, um, really a number of times they, they wake up during this time of hibernation, quote unquote, and they may forage a little bit and then go back to sleep again. But they aren't in nearly the deep sleep that, for example, bats, who are also mammals. Uh, go into. Okay. And what is the process for them to prepare? I've, I've heard different things growing up that the understanding would be they're going to have a big meal or something in order to prepare their bodies mm -hmm. to go into hibernation. What are maybe some of the things they prepare as far as environment to hibernate, like a safe place for them to go? Right. For example, with bats, bats like to find caves or any place is an extreme recess. And they take in food, and so do, for example, bears and other animals, and they'll take in food to build what we call fat reserves. And they mm -hmm. build up these fat reserves reserves and then fat which is extremely high in energy uh, is then broken down by a five-step process and the uh, energy is liberated through that biochemical process giving the creature the needed nutrients and and metabolic uh, functions uh, during that period of hibernation or torpor wow that is very interesting it's not just have a big lunch and take a nap. Right. It's I've more sophisticated heard. than that. Yeah. And researchers really don't know that much about it. What are the physiological processes that occur that helps the, the individual to shut down all the systems and then bring it back up online again? Mm -hmm. uh, this is where I think would be a real challenge for evolution to explain mm -hmm. that through chance and time and natural processes. Uh, I see hibernation as a God-given ability of these creatures based on their environment, the ecological niche that they're in, and, and of course the other environmental factors uh, come into being as well. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that you're mentioning the secular explanation. For an evolutionist, we would think the the environment would bring on changes. The environment is what you know, controls or influences um, the creatures. And could you give more explanation as to what the evolutionary understanding of hibernation is, if you can go a little bit further into that? Yes, I, I think so. Um, they don't really have an evolutionary explanation. For example, in 2020, a fossil was found of something that the evolutionists feel is a prototype to a mammal. And so this fossil was found, and in such a way that it was interpreted as b being a mammal that was hibernating. Now, I don't know how you can tell that from looking at a fossil, but that's <laughs> according to the news story, that this creature was in a hibernation-like uh, situation and, and how they found the fossil there. But the point is, according to evolution, this fossil was 250 million years old. Now, of course, we do not subscribe to that vast mm -hmm. period of time, but it works out for the creationists because we're saying, all right, you're finding a mammal-like creature and it undergoes hibernation and it's 250 million years old. And so as far as the fossil record goes, hibernation has always occurred in mm -hmm. these animals. Yeah. And sometimes evolutionists will say that hibernation in mammals is a recent adaptation. Well, that kind of flies in the face of this discovery in 2020 mm -hmm. of this animal that's allegedly 250 million years old. So one group of evolutionists say the mammals had this ability to hibernate ever so long ago. Others say, no, 
know, uh, mammals hibernating as a recent adaptation. So I guess take your pick. But we as creationists would see that God has given this uh, hibernation activity or estivation to these animals in the beginning, just thousands of years ago. Wow. And with the idea that this is something that animals were created to do, Mm -hmm. I've heard before that maybe this could have been something that the animals on the ark might have experienced. Do you have any ideas about could have hibernation been a factor in the animals on the ark? Right. It's it's again. You know, we would have to take it by case by case basis. Mm-hmm. But we have found that hundreds of animals have the ability to hibernate or go into some kind of suspended animation. Maybe not true hibernation. And this also includes estivation, the summer sleep that I was talking about. But not all animals. And so we would find that some of the animals that perhaps did did not undergo hibernation. What did they do? You know, they were on this cruise for a little over a year. Mm -hmm. They weren't using up a lot of energy or anything like that. They were simply in a small enclosed area for a period of time. So, for example, cattle, cows, and all that, as far as we know, they don't really undergo hibernation. But again, that uh, Noah and his family would be able to take care of them and uh, uh, see to their needs on an almost daily basis. And it really wouldn't be any problem. But... If you had a number of animals that were in some kind of suspended animation, like hibernation, that would free up that time for Noah and his family to to, uh, work with the other animals that didn't hibernate. Could you give us more examples and explanations of different creatures? For example, we have reptiles and uh, mud skippers even. Could you explain maybe how they utilize hibernation or their form of hibernation? Yeah, mud skippers are a type of amphibian. And what they do is they enclose themselves in a slimy cocoon mm. uh, uh, underground <laughs> there, you know, a couple of inches, uh, eight to ten inches, uh, in where they live in the river or something some kind of delta or stream. And under extreme conditions, they will uh, enclose themselves in this slimy cocoon with a breathing tube. And then when the conditions are right, when the rains come, then they are resurrected, as it were, from their their cocoon, and, and they are able to undergo just normal functions and all. So that, that would be one example. Uh, the mountain hummingbird undergoes this uh, experience that we call torpor. Mm-hmm. And mountain hummingbirds are just a metabolic furnace. That's what I call them. They are extreme in in uh, taking the food that they eat and uh, turning the food into adenosine triphosphate energy for the movement of their wings, which are extremely rapid. Their heartbeat, hundreds of times per second. And so it is really quite an amazing process there that they, in a daily basis, will have this extreme a metabolic function only to drop down into a state of torpor and then go back up during the day again and drop back down. So it's rather extreme, for example, the mountain hummingbird in that they can uh, shut everything down to conserve energy and then during the day do what hummingbirds do uh, as they go to various flowers and everything else uh, and in the extreme amount of metabolic function that occurs at that time only to shut back down again. So again, it's a cyclic phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a good example of torpor. Wow. And is that a daily experience that these yes. hummingbirds are having? Wow. Mm-hmm. And not all species of hummingbird. I okay. want to yeah, um, mm-hmm. emphasize that. So this is the kind of research that is being done in regard to hibernation, estivation, torpor, things such as that. Wow. So how does this design of hibernation point to our creator? How can we give him the credit and see the connection of what he's done in these creatures? Well, it is truly amazing when we just take a step back and look at this process of hibernation, look at this process of estivation, what's happening physiologically to this creature. Basically, all their systems are shutting down, but not to the point where they die, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but just very close to death. It's, It's suspended animation. So physiologically, all of these systems have to work together For example, if you're only going to breathe once or twice a minute, then you cannot have a heart rate that's going very, very fast. Mm -hmm. That simply wouldn't work. And so this homeostatic condition, which means that just a normal condition, 
all has to be working at the same time, bringing the metabolic functions down to a point where they're almost very close to death. Some of these deep sleepers that I was talking about, for example, mm -hmm. my favorite, which is the bat. So how can time, chance, and natural processes ever have arrived at such a, such a situation there? Uh, if it was just hit and miss, you would have so many of these creatures millions upon millions that would die mm -hmm. because their metabolic function uh, ceased to function at all and they simply died. And so this is where we as creationists look at something that we call continuous environmental tracking, where we have these sensors, these detectors on the cell membrane of all of these creatures have been talking about, where they're able to take stock of the environment around them, the ecological niche, and move into that ecological niche. And when the conditions are somewhat negative, they have the God-given ability to move into a state of hibernation. And so we can see God's hand of design, the Lord Jesus having designed these creatures in such a way that they have the environmental tracking in a continuous basis, and they can achieve this uh, um, hibernation state without having gone too far and experiencing mm -hmm. death, as it were. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a real good example of the creative hand of God in mm -hmm. achieving this purpose. Yeah, it's such an intricate process. Mm -hmm. And the way that it applies to different creatures, that's a whole thing. And then how it takes place with each creature um, is another just amazing wonder. And then now I feel like I can't call all of my naps hibernation because <laughs> I'm not being nearly as... Um, useful with my energy <laughs> as some of these creatures are but that is so interesting thank you so much for joining us and just giving us information on a topic such as hibernation that maybe others haven't thought about so thank you for being here dr sherwin my pleasure mm -hmm. and thank you to all of our listeners and viewers we appreciate you joining us for another episode you can find this podcast wherever you listen to your podcast or you can watch it here with us on youtube my name is ivana and again this is the creation podcast